Coming up on the next Inspire, menopause. Did you just cringe? It's amazing how one word can have such a negative stigma. However, the truth is, menopause is a phase of life that many find liberating and a time to pursue their dreams. We talk about our new normal as we take this journey through life. Coming up next on Inspire. Inspire is sponsored by Kansas Furniture Mart, using furniture to inspire conversation. And by the Blanche Bryden Foundation. Hello and welcome to Inspire. I'm so excited to be here with my co-hosts, Betty Lou Pardue and Amber Dickinson. And today's topic is menopause and one that historically has been seen as a negative, all due to the perception that this is the time when women lose their fertility, youthfulness and sexuality. And ladies, that could not be further from the truth. Absolutely, Danielle. Menopause is something that should be embraced. Women start new careers, pursue their dreams, and according to menopause myth, put their men on pause? <laughs> Too funny. And couldn't be further from the truth. Here to speak more on the topic of intimacy, the physical and emotional changes we experience, and the liberation of menopause are Laura Seidlinger, Director of Mental Health Programs for Vallejo, and Laura Rivera, nurse and midwife. Ladies, we're so glad you're here. This is such a deep topic. <laughs> we're fired up. And you know, if we could just kind of go through a little bit of the bad before we get to the good because there is a positive but actually there's three stages maybe four of menopause yeah so menopause itself is defined as having an entire year without any menstrual cycle so the years leading up to menopause are defined as the perimenopausal period so that for the average woman will last four to eight years um, most women um, achieve menopause between the ages of 45 and 55 with the average age in the United States being 51. So those years leading up until the final menstrual period, perimenopausal years, are when most women start experiencing symptoms and noticing some changes in their cycles. And then it ends up, of course, with the postmenopausal phase where everything quiets back down. So what are some of the symptoms that people might experience when they begin to go through this process? Probably the most common thing that women report is um, vasomotor symptoms, so hot flashes, night sweats, difficulty sleeping. Um, a lot of women will have vaginal dryness and have um, discomfort with intercourse. Can also have mental health symptoms, forgetfulness, feeling more depressed, um, and just not feeling like they're on their A-game, not have their energy, their, their lives put together. Let's talk about mental fog because yes. I immediately went into menopause at 41 when I had to have an emergency hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. So I missed all those, you know, years of getting into it to just get into it. But mental fog was one of the biggest things that I had to deal with. Can you talk to us about that and some of the ways that we can cope with that? Sure. So the mental fog sometimes can be um, some unmasked depression that's happening. It can be just that the fluctuation in the neurotransmitters in the body, in particular uh, serotonin and uh, norepinephrine, which help us with concentration and focus, get a little out of balance. And that's why one of the first line medication therapies we might use is actually an antidepressant. And when we help with that neuro, with that thermoregulation piece, then we help with the flushing, the night sweats, the hot flashes, but also then because you're having less uh, night sweats, the insomnia also can be uh, relieved significantly. So people then start getting into a better sleep cycle, which of course then they have better cognition and function, less mental fog. So when, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> what can we do to, to help others understand 
what a woman's going through and help her alleviate some of that stigma of the negativity? I think the best thing we can do is talk about it. It's just as normal as going through puberty, as getting pregnant, having a baby, being postpartum, breastfeeding. Um, I think there's a, a stigma associated with it that women don't feel comfortable discussing menopause and symptoms. And if we just honor the normalcy of it as a regular life event and acknowledge it is what it is, and every woman has different symptoms and experiences a different transition, um, that that just openness is the very best start to helping women move through menopause. So I have a question about this because it is a perfectly normal thing that's inevitable, that's going to happen to every woman, but it does seem like it's sort of a cringe-worthy topic, like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that we sort of don't wanna talk about this. Why is that? What is the stigma? Is it just that women's bodies uh, are so valued because of the fertil fertility that once that is not on the table anymore that, that we're sort of dismissed? Like, what is the stigma behind why women don't openly discuss this? Well, I think that there can be some of that, but I also think that women are just viewed so differently, especially in the workplace. About 11% of women in the United States right now are in that menopausal window, that 45 to 55 range. But that actually, because we have so many in, women in the workforce, that's gonna grow to 25% by 2030. And so one in four people that you're going to be in the workplace with is potentially going to be experiencing some of these things. And so we have to start talking about it. Just as we have to be more sensitive in our workplace with other issues, this is something we need to discuss and, and recognize and not be afraid of. One of the things that I uh, find very interesting is when women just are very honest and saying, I'm in a meeting and all of a sudden I'm having a hot flash and I need a break just asking for what you need. I need a moment, could we take a 10 minute break? And just letting everyone step back or being honest with your uh, boss or your supervisor and saying, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little more forgetful, I'm going through menopause and I just forgot to put that on my schedule today. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm gonna correct that going forward. And that way you have a plan for managing it. And I think that's part of it is there are some great pharmacologic interventions that we can use to help women in menopause, but I think there's also some great non-pharmacologic strategies too. I don't know about you, but I feel liberated now that I'm in menopause. I never have to deal with a cycle ever again. Let's just have some Yay. applause for that. Never having to think about the next steps in terms of having to deal with the cycle yeah. is a beautiful thing. No fear of pregnancy. No fear of pregnancy. Yeah. That's another thing to be excited about. Uh, I, but I think that women are changing and I think that growing older is something that is changing as well because it's not dreaded. We're no longer Aunt bees with the bun on our heads. Right. We're still just as active and into things as, as ever. Talk about that because it's not something that has to be such like doom and gloom. Right. 50 is the new 30, right? Thank we'll start you know, there. The we'll <laughs> start there. Foxy at 50. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, and I definitely do think it's liberating for women. I think when women become sexually active, the thing they worry about the most all the way through their sexual lifespan is pregnancy up until menopause. And then all of a sudden it's, I can have sex and I don't have to worry about a baby. Yes. You know? And you don't have so. to worry about all of the medications, the birth control mm -hmm. pills, everything. That can be gone and you know, that's liberating mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a period in your life where maybe kids have moved out of the house, you're in your home alone with your partner and you can really just kind of let loose and enjoy each other and not have to worry about all the little things you worried about leading up to that point. You got your life back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about sex and intimacy and whatever else comes up, but we'll be right back. We're back with Laura Seidlinger and Lara Rivera. Ladies, in the last segment, we discussed the stages of menopause and sort of what women can expect when they start experiencing these things. So now let's move into talking about this idea of intimacy and, and treatment. Well, so when women go through menopause, there's definitely a change in the estrogenation to the vaginal tissue. Um, women end up typically with more vaginal dryness, irritation, discomfort with intercourse, and there's lots of ways to address that. 
Um, probably the easiest is over-the-counter vaginal moisturizers or vaginal lubricants, um, which both act in slightly different ways. Um, and then also vaginal estrogen, which is delivered more locally to that tissue versus oral hormone therapy, which is more systemically delivered, is a very nice way to re-estrogenize that tissue and make intercourse more comfortable. Well, let's talk about some of the good stuff, because I know personally that I feel a little happier when it comes to intimacy and being involved in relationship. Is that something that's a natural byproduct or is it just the opposite for most women? Oh, that's a great question. I think just as with any experience, it can, it can go either way. Um, some women feel very liberated by this and are excited about this new time in their life and they really start to seek new experiences between the sheets with their partners. Uh, but others, I think, are a little bit more reluctant. They feel like their bodies change. They feel like there might be something wrong with them. And that's why I think it's really critical that they go get that first physical health exam, make sure they get labs drawn. Let's make sure there's not an underlying medical problem that could be contributing to why they're feeling the way they are. And then at that point, then look at the possible interventions, whether it's with medications, whether it's with cognitive behavioral therapy, whether it's learning some new coping skills, um, maybe just some lifestyle practices, making lists so that you don't forget important events, having one master calendar instead of having the one on your phone, the one in your purse, the one at home on the refrigerator, <laughs> and keeping things in one location that really can help everyone feel a little bit more uh, successful and like they have it all together. Mm -hmm. You were c kind of talking about a little bit about when you're going to the doctor, you, you need to get all this done, but how do you get across to them that that's really what your concern is? Because it seems like, I was reading some statistic that 80% of medical personnel are not really trained on the menopause. Is that factual? Bad news, what? No, I, I do think there are definitely providers that are very skilled in care of menopausal women and the symptoms. And so I would recommend that women look for a NAMS certified provider, which is the North American Menopause Society. And there are providers locally in our area that have received that training. So they really have very intimate knowledge, no pun intended, of, <laughs> of all of the ins and outs of, of intimacy and how that changes with menopause. So finding the right provider is important and then feeling comfortable talking about it with your provider because I can't tell you how many women call, they make an appointment for a problem and then they get in the room with the door shut and they say, that's not why I made the appointment. I made it for this reason, but they didn't even feel comfortable telling the front you know, the person yeah. that answered the phone, why they were coming in. Because they didn't want to be poo-pooed, you know, like, mm -hmm. hey, this is, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah, and you know, I mean, sex should be fun. Sex should be fun as long as you're having sex. If you're in a healthy relationship, it should be enjoyable. And there's always things that we can do to make sex better if it's not fun for a person. So another really great thing that we can offer for women is pelvic floor physical therapy. There are women that suffer from relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles and have issues with urinary incontinence and pain during intercourse. And pelvic floor phys physical therapy is a great way for them to kind of get back what they had lost. Regain that strength mm -hmm. and control again. So for women who are interested in maybe spicing up their sex life or changing things up, what are some resources for women that, they, that are accessible, um, that especially maybe for women that are timid to, to talk to girlfriends or talk to someone? You know, where are places that women can look to to get information about this? Great question. So I think that you, um, I think that's great if you have a girlfriend or a set of girlfriends who you can talk to about those experiences, but there are other resources in the community. Um, there are therapists who deal with intimacy issues. Um, there are mental health providers who are dual certified in primary care like myself. Um, and then there's the, the women's health uh, personnel, the health care workers in there, like Laura, who's a midwife. This is something she's very comfortable with and, and having that conversation. Um, so there are places to go. And I don't think that we can underestimate the importance of some of the basics, like healthy eating, getting appropriate exercise. Uh, in particular, we need weight-bearing exercises as we're getting older to protect us from osteoporosis in menopause, mm -hmm. but we also need that cardio, that aerobic activities to protect our heart, 
for, from cardiovascular disease, and we need to make sure that we're staying on a good sleep cycle. If we don't uh, get into that REM sleep cycle, then we're not getting our reset button hit. So if the earlier interventions, maybe starting on some medications or some topical estrogen cream isn't helping, then it might be the time to go to speak to somebody who uh, deals more with sleep issues, pulmonology, mental health, or frequently uh, providing interventions there so that that can be part of the um, recovery. We've talked about clinical ways to deal with menopause, but what about our mates? Because I remember Michael, when he first heard that I was going to enter into menopause, he was like, oh, dear Jesus, <laughs> here we go. And I was like, what? Because I had no real idea as to what the journey was going to be like. How do we talk to our mates about it and make them okay with the changes? Well, I think part of it is just that really good, open, honest communication. I think the stigma says mm -hmm. we're going to be moody, evil, ugly people, kind of bitchy. <laughs> and that really isn't necessarily the case for, for most women. Um, some women will go through all the way through the menopause process and just kind of all of a sudden realize one day, I, didn't, I haven't had a period in a really long time yeah. and <laughs> never truly be symptomatic. But I think other women, and, and it comes down to that communication, you know, saying, I want you to know that I'm starting to have irregular cycles now. And so this might be that me entering that phase of my life. And I just want you to be aware of it. Um, I might be a little more moody or I might be a little more forgetful, but frankly, I just need you to let me know if that's happening so that I can make sure I'm doing what I can to be my best. And maybe that's go to have a conversation with my provider or get on medication. Thank you both for being here. What what a discussion. You know, we could talk a lot yeah, more. Yeah, yes, we could do this for hours. But we thank you, Lara and Laura, for being here on Inspire. And coming up after a short break, Danielle and Amber and I will be back to continue our discussion. And you never know. So stay with us. <laughs> Thanks ladies, I'm Sarah Starr and I'm excited to bring you a bit of inspiration to add to your daily activity routine. In today's session, we'll be focusing on creating a stronger core. A strong core not only looks great, but helps to stabilize our bodies and improve balance. It also helps to create better posture. And when we have better posture, we have less back pain. Join me for this quick accessible yoga practice as we strengthen our hip flexors and core while using a chair for support. Relax and remember your happy yoga smile. Namaste. Let's begin our practice by coming to stand with your right hip closest to the chair, using your right hand to the chair for support. Shift your weight into your right foot. Pick up your left foot, drawing your left knee in closer, strengthening through your hip flexors, core, and quadriceps. For more of a challenge, extend your left leg to hover. Continue breathing deeply as you reach your left arm to the sky. Release and repeat to the opposite side, standing with your left hip closest to the chair. Shift your weight into your left foot. Pick up your right foot, drawing your right knee in closer. For more of a challenge, Extend your right leg to hover. Continue standing tall, lightly lifting your lower belly towards your spine as you reach your right arm to the sky. Release, coming to face the seat of your chair, transitioning into down dog. Place your hands to the seat of your chair and step your feet back hip width apart or slightly wider. Stay connected to your breath, toning through your belly, pressing the tops of your thighs back. Feeling unrushed, step your feet forward with your feet below your hips and your hands to the seat of the chair in line with your shoulders. Exploring modified cat-cow stretch. Inhale, lift through your heart. Exhale, round your spine, chin towards your chest. Continue wrapping this movement around your breath. With each inhale, lift through your heart. 
tilting your pelvis forward lightly, and with each exhale, round your spine, drawing your navel back, chin towards your chest, lengthening your tailbone under slightly. Adding on, inhale, lift and extend through your right leg. Exhale, draw your knee towards your navel, rounding your spine, coiling your navel back, chin towards your chest. Continue moving at your own pace. With each inhale, lift and lengthen, extending your leg back. And with each exhale, round your spine, drawing your knee towards your navel, chin towards your chest, stretching across your upper back. Transitioning into modified spinal balance, pause with your right leg extended, with your right knee pointing towards the earth. Extend your left arm forward, shoulder height, reaching through your fingertips. Continue drawing your navel back, keeping your spine neutral, pressing back through the ball of the right foot to lengthen, feeling the back of your neck long. Release, setting your right foot to the earth, repeating to the opposite side. Inhale, lift and extend through your left leg. Exhale, draw your knee in towards your chest, rounding your spine, coiling your navel back, chin towards your chest. Continue wrapping this energizing movement around your breath. Transitioning into modified spinal balance, pause with your left leg extended, reaching back through the ball of your left foot. Extend your right arm forward, shoulder height, reaching through your fingertips. Continue to keep your spine in a neutral position, lengthening through the crown of your head and back through your tailbone with your core engaged. Stay connected to your breath as you release Transitioning into Down Dog. Step your feet back, hip width apart or slightly wider. Breathe as you stretch your hips back, rolling your shoulders open away from your ears, allowing gravity to lengthen your spine. Continue cultivating awareness as you slowly walk your feet in. Coming to take a seat, completing our yoga practice for today. Namaste. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully I've inspired more activity and mindfulness in your day. See you next time. And we're back ladies. We had a great discussion earlier with our guests about menopause, a topic that makes a lot of women uncomfortable, but we all need to realize that this is not the end, but rather a new beginning. Ladies, what are your takeaways from this conversation? Well, I know you got fired I up. So <laughs> got takeaways. I'm just so struck by the fact that this is something that we, we have felt almost ashamed to talk about or that this is not something that we are just naturally taught when we're taught other things about sexuality or, or who we are as women. And so I'm really excited for the possibility that this just becomes a mainstream conversation and, mm -hmm. and that, you know, we were talking earlier and I was even nervous thinking about, oh my gosh, we're going to say all these things on the show today. And, and I thought, but why am I nervous? Because this happens to to every woman. Mm -hmm. So I'm just so thankful that we've had this opportunity to talk about these things. But you've done some research back to the days of the Greeks. Yes, <laughs> tell us your research. We, have to, we have to hear that and you guys are gonna love it. Okay. You're gonna love it. Well basically, yeah. it's just, it's just these ideas about what it meant to be a woman. And women at the time were really regarded as just uh, baby making machines essentially right and that once you were unable to be fertile that you were just dismissed from society or you were somehow seen as just just somebody that was worthy of nothing and and to see that women's value has historically hinged upon their fertility is, is just wrong for so many reasons because number one not every woman wants to have a baby mm -hmm. right? right not every woman can have a baby mm -hmm. and so to tell women as a whole that your worth is based on your fertility is is just abominable really mm -hmm. <laughs> and I I bet you can guess who was doing most of the work on writing these uh, these ideas. Men. Yes. <laughs> good, good. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I'm so lucky that I have a mother who's very progressive, and I think when she hit her 50s, she got her first tattoo, and she was out there, she was a widow, and she was hitting it like it was like to be hitting. So needless to say, I am so excited as I approach 50 that mm -hmm. I have some of my mother in me. So it's an exciting time. I am thrilled to be able to do new things, try new things, and I'm just ready to explore everything. I feel like I'm fully feminine now. I feel like I'm fully engaged in that whole mode of being the modern woman and 50 is a new 30, which <laughs> right. could be 20. I don't care. Right. I'm embracing 50 as it's the gift that I've always wanted and just didn't know. I just, I love it too because it's so positive and there's so, you know, the world is open. The world you can is do open. whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. But like uh, Lara and Laura were saying earlier, a lot of times nobody spoke about it. Your your mother never said anything about it. You know, somebody in phys ed at school, mm -hmm. nobody talked about it. So great about your mom. Yeah. She is definitely yeah. a role model for me. She is 68 years old. Actually, will be 68. Happy birthday, early mom. <laughs> and uh, she is out there living her life, and she goes to concerts by herself, and yes. she is sassy, and men are coming up to her <laughs> like, hey, Wanda, how you doing? And I'm like, this is going to be me in my 60s. So I'm just excited for what's to come. I love what you said about feeling fully feminine. Like, I felt like I was looking at you with heart eye emojis. Mm -hmm. Because it's like um, this idea that we are somehow not feminine anymore when we hit a certain age or when certain things happen to us, you know, I think it's that's such an outdated way of thinking and I, and I think that's a beautiful a beautiful way to explain it that you're fully feminine. I love that. <laughs> you know, I do want to get back if we ever have them, you know, cuz some women who don't feel feminine anymore who have backed away from sexuality or even trying to find a partner. I mean, I wonder, like she was talking, there's there's some topics that you can get into and some uh, therapy and that type of thing too, but that's something that we could explore. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, in the meantime, Google. Yeah. You know, because yes. there's a wealth of information that you can find online. And if you're shy about talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you could always go and start your research there. But yeah. Google carefully. Use your, choose your words wisely yes. as you do the Google. Yes, baby <laughs> chicks can mean a whole lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying that I know. <laughs> Just one for the other. <laughs>